Okay. So hello everyone out there on the uh, World Wide Web. Special to those who are absent today. Mr. Cooksley, Mr. Schmitz, and Ms. Moore. Okay. From yesterday, I know with this group, we did actually take some notes um, from the video that we watched yesterday. Um, if we could just do a recap of that, for those of you obviously in, sec in first and third, you're just going to have to jot down a few things to this, but I again want to go through and make sure that this is all down. Oops. Okay. From the video, and I don't know who's got their notes out ready to roll, but if you could please, that would help me a bunch. Again, we're doing this a little bit differently. Okay, what do I have on here? So I've got stuff from the church. Okay, so we talked about at the very beginning, um, Democritus. Okay, um, so we've got Democritus. He uh, was a Greek. Atoms were made of everything. Plato and Aristotle, they were kind of like the big influential people at the time. So like say the president, thank you. So the, let's say like the president, or say like in basketball, LeBron James, or in football, Peyton Manning, uh, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers. Not that I'm fans of them, but you know what I'm, I'm getting at there. Or like in baseball, uh, Derek Jeter. He'd be influential there as he's played the game a long time and has done very well. In other words, when they talk, people listen. Okay, so Plato and Aristotle said, Democritus, don't listen to him. He's full of garbage. Okay, so people didn't listen to him. Well, then we, then science just kind of went on for 2,000 years really with nothing because then after the Greek and Roman civilizations, you have the church in control, the Dark Ages, which the problem was not that church being in control is a bad thing, but they limited what could be done. They obviously had the idea that the world was flat, and from what they were saying, world is flat, okay. If you were to speak out against that, what would happen to you? See ya. Do not advance, do not advance to home, do not collect two hundred dollars. Yeah. Don't go past go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. He said don't go to home. Okay. Yeah. You get you, you get what I mean. I, I think okay. I'm So um, it was either that or I'm so sorry. I repent. Sorry. Let me back in. Take back what you said. Okay. So one of the scientists I think that they talked about in the video was uh, a guy with the last name of Bacon. And that's what he did. He had some findings, but he had to renege on his ideas in order not to get excommunicated from the church. Okay, so scientific advancement really did not happen until around the start of really about the 15 and 1600s, which I believe was called the period of enlightenment, if I remember correctly. If knowing my history correctly, I believe that is. Again, I may be a little bit off on those periods. I'm... Not exact. But at the same time, too, that's when a lot of these discoveries first started to happen. From your reading, what did the, going back to the Greeks, what did the Greeks originally think? Everything was made of fire, air, water, and earth. Oh, yeah. 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 Love the example of a rabbit. Yeah. Uh, that made my name. Yeah. Fire, earth, water. Yeah, so a rabbit's made of fire, air, earth, and water. The fire component is the idea that it's warm. The water component, more water means it's going to be fluffier or something soft. like that. Or soft. What's so funny about this rabbit thing? <laughs> but obviously, well, to us now, it's funny because we know that water obviously is not an element. We know that the earth itself is not an element, but we do know that these things are made of elements. So these things here can be broken down much, much more. In fact, can anyone name any elements that you find in the earth that are mined for? Iron. Gold. Iron. Gold. Gold. Silver. 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 Copper. Platinum. Copper. Platinum. Platinum. 
iridium, aluminum, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Okay, so yes, the earth is made of elements. Water, water is made of two elements. What are those two elements? Hydrogen and oxygen. Two Air, air is made up of a lot of different elements and it all frankly depends on what molecules are up there. Did you know, here's a did you know for you. You know what most of our air is actually composed of? You've either heard me say that before, or you knew that off the top of your head. Boy, boy, no. Nitrogen gas. I think it's blaze. Okay. Nitrogen gas composed most of our air. Jacob might have known that too. But I know it. Or maybe spent, or whichever. Some of you may have known that already. Okay. Anyway, the idea being that most of it's nitrogen gas. Only about 20% of our air is actually oxygen gas. <gasps> Only 20%. But it is the second most abundant, I do believe. We also have helium that naturally occurs in the air. Okay. So we can make really squeaky noises if we just suck in enough air. Is that the actual oxygen or what? Okay. They, um, they did... What's that? Red rock or yeah, it was just a rock, and it was mercury. It was, I think it was, it was mercury. Yeah, down was the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's made oxygen and mercury. It made mercury. Joseph Priestley. Yeah. He discovered an element known. Well, he did, he had a compound known, a mineral known as mercury calx, that when you heated it up, the the um, the rock itself turned into a grayish liquid, mercury, and it produced a gas. That gas. When you put uh, put it into a jar and you put a mouse into it, the mouse would live for longer, and okay. an ox a flame would burn brighter. It was oxygen. It was oxygen. I the originally oh. named it, yeah. I okay. The originally named they originally originally named that thing phlogiston. Yeah. yeah. It was a p word. Uh huh. Phlogiston, and it's really unique because this is actually a great science history lesson in terms of how it discuss how one thing builds. On another, it really does. Everybody's thoughts just came to one. Right. They, each of these scientists did their own experiment, and from the results of those experiments, scientists then later could see what they did, took in their ideas, did their own experiment, found their own things, and incorporated all their ideas in with their findings. So it's just kind of like we kept building, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like a record of ideas. And as that record book got thicker, we could start to apply more of those ideas in a more practical fashion. Uh, let's see. A few others that we talked about from the movie yesterday, Gilbert. What did he do with the cat? Uh, static electricity. Static electricity. The fur against the metal. And that uh, you had like a static electricity. Benjamin Franklin, the same thing with the kite got struck by lightning with the kite. The idea that particles have a charge to them. And then Coulomb, a long distant relative of LL. Like the charge repulses. The closer to yep. the repulsion. Repulsive force. As two light charged particles come closer together, the more repulsion you feel. Kind of like taking two of the same sides of a magnet and trying to push them together. The closer you bring them, the more resistance you feel. I'm going to get like giant magnets. In fact, I've got some magnets in here that are strong. I've got some weaker ones too. I bet you are strong. I bet you are strong. Oh, yeah, just there. So as you try to take the I'm sorry, the cool so, yeah. as you try to take the like sides of the magnets together, they won't exactly go well together because they push away from one another. You don't feel it so much here, but the closer you get, the more you feel them trying to push from one another. If you touch them together, it just like create a nuclear explosion of awesome. What a creative blaze. <laughs> 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 who, said, who said that one? Is that Dylan or is that Jacob or Seth? Uh, what did you say? Okay, I just started coming Dilla, back. Creative blaze, get it? it blaze, huh? <laughs> okay, so, <coughs> so, 
all these ideas. Now, um, going and starting soon and earlier in the history, we have Galileo, and then later after him, a fellow by the name of Evangelista Torricelli. Yeah, I know how to be how to say that. <laughs> it's okay. No worries. All right. Um, I just said that word. Torricelli. Cool name. What did Torricelli do? Tortilla shell. Tortilla shell. I think he did something, he was, was it with the moon? Yeah, he, did, he was dealing with the moon. He did the barometer. Barometer, yeah. Okay, so it starts here. It talks about um, Torricelli showed that um, air had weight. He took, and you get to now see my terrible artistic skills again, aren't you? So How would you be able to do this, though? Demonstrating up on the board. Oh, oh shit. Who is it? I don't know. Grass State Man. Green. It's me. She's been sitting there for an hour. Trench coat. Yeah, I told you. What? Some creeper out there. Yeah, creeper out here. Trench coat on. Out of state. Looks like. Where'd she go? It's me. She's down. Car. Silver car. Looks like California. I'm scared. Anyway, don't worry. The off. She'll. She'll come into the office and then take care of her there, whichever. <laughs> okay, so I know I have blue drawn in here, but um, this blue, consider it to be like mercury. Okay, obviously I know it's not mercury, but consider it to be kind of like mercury. Well, mercury then rose in the tube. Explosion. Yeah, guess what? When it was really nice weather, it was about somewhere up here, maybe a little higher. But if the weather got crappy, uh -oh. and we started to have lightning, bang! A tornado. Guess what happened to the barometer? The world explodes. Okay, so. Why does the barometer do that? <laughs> well, like, why does it, why is, like, low pressure bad? I know what to say. I know what to say. Okay, so high pressure, meaning, like, good weather, low pressure, bad weather. In other words, what has to happen for the mercury to rise in this thing? What must be going on that the air particles are doing that that mercury rises in the tube? Think about it, okay? Think about how you feel, how you would feel in New Orleans compared to how you would feel if you went way up in elevation to Denver. What's the difference? I think New Orleans would be, be more humid. Be You'd have more humidity. You'd have well, more I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about like weather itself, like humidity or temperature. I'm just talking about in terms of what happens if you go pressure. really high up. How do you oh, feel? Your ears you get tired like, really fast. You get low yeah. pressure. Your, ear, your ears pop because there's less pressure up there. And it's harder to breathe. Harder to breathe. Also Same. less oxygen. Okay, so when you're closer down to sea level, there's more particles. When you're higher up, there's fewer particles. Well, guess what? This works because air particles push down. Guess what? The idea here, Torricelli proved, air has weight. Air has weight. Air has pressure. Consider this. The syringe. We know there's air in here. I push it down. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. Which which would be more pressure? Here or there? Down there. Down here. Okay. Well, since I'm pushing down here, what are those particles going to be doing more of? They're moving around faster. Moving around faster and? They're going to be hitting each other. Yeah. So the whole idea of pressure deals with particles colliding with one another. The more collisions, 
the more pressure and it pushes down. So the air is pushing down on this mercury causing it to go up in the tube. Well, in a high pressure system, nice weather, you don't have so much of that going on. Now in a low pressure system, what happens is the low pressure system allows things more easily to fall, like rain and snow and sleet and hail. And it allows the air and the winds to blow upward. In fact, a high pressure system, the way it works, just a little bit of a weather, quick short weather lesson here for you. Low pressure, you have air moving from the bottom to the top in a low pressure system. So air moving from the ground up to the sky or above like the clouds. Now, the high never down. I'm sorry, what? Is that why it never curls down when they show it on TV? Yeah. So like the whole idea here, let's draw a couple here. Let's have L be the, or the red be the low pressure. <laughs> And let's have H be over here. Okay. So, basically you have the air on the ground goes from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. It gets sucked up into the area of low pressure. It goes up into the sky and then guess what the jet stream then carries that air to the high pressure system where it circulates it back down to the ground so and it's this continuous cycle that's why you have a jet stream the jet stream is literally the air that is flowing from one system to another system although also you can have systems between jet streams but that's the basic idea yeah. When you get a storm, though, wouldn't it be high pressure because there's more pressure in the air? When you get uh, a storm? Yeah, because well, you feel... But low pressure would, like, suck up stuff, so wouldn't it be like a tornado? Yes. Okay. So low pressure suck sucks things upward. So and basically what's going on there, too, is you have... Think about it. When you have a low pressure system in the summertime it comes in, it's really hot. And when the front arrives, it sucks that hot air up. And then when you have a high pressure system come in, think especially like in the winter time, when that high pressure system moves in in the middle of the winter, it generally gets colder. So that high behind is generally a little bit cooler than the low. In terms of if you're talking like from system to system. High pressure, the temperature is usually a little cooler. It's bringing the air from up, down. Because as you tend to go up in the atmosphere, you do get colder. The low sucks that air from the ground that's warmer up to the top. And it's this continuing cycle. Why does it cold, get colder the farther you go up? Because like high it rises? It, it also depends on the different layers of the atmosphere. Because as you go up in this part of the atmosphere, the temperature actually goes down. But once you get to the next level, then it starts going up. And then to the next level, it starts going down. Is that why it's relatively colder on airplanes? Mm-hmm. This part, if and again, if I'm screwing up my terminology, I apologize. Hopefully, I'm not. I'm not looking at my information in front of me. But I believe it's we're in what's called the troposphere, and then you have the mesosphere, mesosphere above that, and then the stratosphere above that. Again, I would have to look and confirm on that without my notes in front of me. I wasn't planning on getting into this, but your questions just kind of went that direction. That's why your ears pop up when you're in your airplanes. Yeah, less pressure. Less pressure. So, yeah. A low pressure system, obviously, the air particles are going up, so you're going to have less pressure pushing down on you. So, getting to that, back to that basic idea, obviously, if you have air coming down, that means there's going to be more pressure pushing down. But if you have air being sucked up, there's going to be less air particles pushing down on you. That's the point to drive home with that. Since there's low pressure, how can you reach up? If there's what? When it's low pressure, when you go up higher, 
Why do you agree with that? Because also when you're going up in elevation, there is naturally less pressure because there are fewer air particles. But why do your ears yeah, pop? Yeah, why do your ears pop? Your ears pop in order to regulate the pressure inside your head. Because basically, your, it, for your body takes a while to catch up to it. So you can naturally rise up, but your body just has to adjust. We have inside of us parts inside of our ear, our I can't remember if it's, our, if it's like our eardrums. Or there, I can't, there's a part in our inner ear that helps to regulate the pressure. And when that membrane opens, it'll let air in or let air out to help regulate the pressure. I can't remember what the specific part is right now off the top of my head. Is that like why when you're scuba diving, you have to come up slowly? Otherwise, mm -hmm. kind of yeah. Like You've got to give your body time to adjust to it. Good if you go down far enough. Yeah. Too well, and the farther you go down in the ocean, again, the more pressure. pressure there's going to be on you. Think about all the weight of that water on you. Yes. So, hence, they also have to regulate pressure in a submarine. One got crushed not too long ago. They went further than they're supposed to. They got crushed. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. I know there was a lot in terms of pressure. I wasn't planning on talking that much about it, but anyway. Moving on then, unless there's other questions about Torricelli and pressure and how that all works. Do you have a barometer? Do I have a barometer in here? Used to, but I broke it by accident. Sorry. Okay. Um, so anyway, Torricelli came up with that idea. Then you have um, Priestley and the mercury calcs and all of all those experiments of what he did. Uh, breaking up the mercury calcs into mercury and oxygen gas. Um, that wasn't so much of a big one, but then, um, let's see, Lavoisier, Antoine Lavoisier, you guys did some experiments earlier this year that mimicked um, an idea of his. You guys remember the experiments where he had you had to take ice yep. in a in a vial and then melt it. Yeah. yeah. And then you had to take like two chemicals, take their masses to begin with, right, mix them, take the final mass, steel wool together, mm -hmm. steel wool apart, all those things. What was the concept that we were trying to um, figure out from that? No conservation lost or gain. Yep. Nothing. No mass is lost or gained. The idea of law of conservation of mass. And I'm also just going to put down here Priestley. Mercury calcs, which broke up into mercury and oxygen gas. Okay. So that was Priestley's idea. That was what Priestley did. <coughs> Um, okay, now, I think that pretty much takes care of it, other than um, we also had another guy by the name of Joseph Proust. Oh, we already got him from yesterday, didn't we? Yeah, we had all, the, everybody except the Torrelli guy. Here. Okay, so Proust came up with the idea that all these compounds are made up of elements, and those elements are in proportion to one another. So then to drive this whole thing home, I'm going to erase the thing over in the corner here and dealing with the pressures. Don, Dalton Kimball's long lost grandfather. <coughs> John Dalton. Oh, but how is that related to John Dalton? Dalton, Dalton. Oh, but one's last name is first name. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Um, Dalton's idea is called the atomic theory. Okay, so Dalton's atomic theory. All really Dalton did is he took all these ideas and he combined it. That's really the mastery behind it. And the funny thing is he really didn't do any experiments per se. It's just that he took all of this knowledge and these experiments and ideas and combined it all together in kind of one nice little neat book package. Okay? First thing he said, 
Democritus, the whole idea that all matter is composed of atoms. So all matter made of atoms. And those atoms are indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Not even a ha ha with that. Okay. I was All right. I was laughing. Thank you. Okay. The second part of it deals perfectly with the idea that Priestley got, which is okay, this mercury calx is made of two different things mercury and oxygen gas. They're two different elements. So, atoms of same element. Are identical, but um, different elements have different properties. Different elements, different properties. So, really, a big idea out of Priestley's experiment there. Third one, kind of coming from the idea of Lavoisier and also from Joseph Proust. The third idea being that chemical reactions involve the combination of atoms, not the destruction. Because law of conservation of mass is all about atoms are not created, atoms are not destroyed. So chemical reactions involve combination, and I'm going to add my own little tweak to it here too, reorganization. Because that's what atoms are doing. They're combining and they're reorganizing. No destruction. Yes, we can still have things go boom. But what a boom is, is a chemical reaction, making new products. And then lastly, the fourth idea coming from Proust, if you have these chemical reactions happen, they do so in whole number ratios. And I just realized I'm out of time. So I'll finish with bullet point number four tomorrow. Then we're going to talk about two fellas that really had some work to do on the atoms. J.J. Thompson and Ernest Rutherford. We'll call it a good day. Have a great day, everyone.